Okay, so this week's video is going to start a little differently because I am absolutely heartbroken. Like my heart has been smashed uh, this entire week and um, I have continued to see clients and continued to see a mom, uh, be a mom and be a wife and be a friend. And um, I think this week has pretty much just put me over the edge in terms of capacity. Um, for those of you who live in the United States, uh, you probably are well aware of what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, there's been a lot that has come to uh, public attention around police brutality and injustice and racism. And uh, in response, there's been lots of rioting um, in multiple cities across the U.S. Um, there was rioting uh, in San Jose um, on Friday and Friday night where I live. And also, you know, Portland, Denver, Detroit, uh, New York, D.C., uh, Florida. There's been protests and parades. And um, I think how I'm holding all of that and how I've been processing all of that just as, a, as an EMDR therapist is that um, I'm realizing that, you know, we all as EMDR clinicians, we know a lot of things, right? We... Um, know a lot of things, we've been taught a lot of things, either in client sessions or personally or in, in our trainings or courses in grad school. Um, but it's different to live all the things we know in all at once in a very overwhelming way, right? So we understand um, conceptually and maybe personally for some of us about individual trauma. We understand familial trauma. We understand generational trauma. We understand societal trauma. And for all of us to be seeing that so clearly and feeling that so much um, has been incredibly hard, um, I imagine, for a lot of us. And I just, I wanted to name that before I started this week's video because it seems inappropriate not to. Um, and, you know, we understand that relationships um, ha can form attachments based around hate and based around othering and fear. Um, but we also know that attachments can be uh, securely created around love and hope and bravery. And I've been thinking a lot about that today um, before I came on here to make this video. And in that space of love and hope and bravery is and realness is how I'd like to um, form our attachment and our connection uh, just in terms of um, how we attach to each other, even through video right now, because that's how we're all able to connect is, is virtually. So just know that, you know, as an EMDR community, I'm coming into this space to connect with you from a place of love, hope, and bravery. And I hope that you, while being real, can join me in that invitation. Um, given the events of the last week, I feel really inspired and committed to, um, you know, uh, as a mother to teach my kids about what's right and wrong. Um, I feel inspired to, um, I, I feel like recommitted to making sure that our community, our EMGR community has what it needs now, um, personally, professionally, and just for our clients. Um, so I'm, I'm committed to like continuing to share, continuing to, um, share my friendship with you, share my voice with you, share my ideas with you, because I really would like to make sure that we all have increased capacity right now, um, for our community when so many of us are just exhausted in 800 different ways. Um, so just know that, you know, I really believe that we're being asked to heal the world right now in a very different way. Um, than I've ever experienced in my generation, um, which makes you so important right now. So I just, if, if you take nothing else away from this video today, just know that you are so important and you are so cherished and appreciated. I just, I need you to know that. Um, I need you to get filled up by that uh, because we, we need to tell each other that right now. So just know that I, I get that and I'm giving you that and I'm believing that about you. That if you are interested enough in watching this video to get more capacity and get more um, tools and resilience for yourself and your clients, you are so important. So thank you. Thank you for being interested um, and continuing to fill yourself up. So um, in the spirit of offering, in the spirit of capacity building today, um, especially when we're all incredibly tired, um, 
I wanted to share a couple metaphors that I use to help either uh, current and or potential clients um, understand what is EMDR like, okay? Um, I don't get the sense that clients really understand that. I know that there's a couple of videos floating around like from Andrea, maybe some others to explain what EMDR is. Um, I've noticed a lot of those videos tend to be more academic or um, the language doesn't feel very accessible um, to, uh, to clients. And so I'm hoping that by sharing these metaphors that I use with you, that you can take them and run with them and use them to help clients understand what it's like, because we really want to make sure that people have so much access to, to healing right now. So this, this feels really important to me and I hope this feels helpful to you. So, um, I also wanted to say that, you know, um, people's ability right now, my, my own included, is um, we're all going to be less capable right now of grasping lots of conceptual language, right? So I, I have a background in academia. I was at Stanford for 14 years and um, written, you know, research papers. And I just, I feel like all that language and all that information is helpful. But I think in terms of clients, we need to have language they can really understand given that they're low capacity, they're overwhelmed by big events, and they're overwhelmed by big feelings, as are we. So hopefully these metaphors feel helpful. Um, and again, if you want um, a handout with any of this information, you can go ahead and email me, cambria at cambriaevans.com. I love hearing from you. I've, I have friends now in, in Greece and a bunch of other countries. It's, it's fun to connect that way. Um, or you can, there's a little link I'll put down in the description of the video and you can sign up for my mailing list and you'll be on it. And then if I ever make a video or I create a free resource, you'll just automatically get um, what I'm making and what I'm sharing. So then you just have it if you want to use it. So in thinking about um, metaphors for how to explain EMDR, before I get into that, I want to say that if you are an EMDR clinician and you have not done EMDR treatment for yourself, please do that. <laughs> please make sure that you are in a place where you understand what it's like for your clients to go through that and to get there, okay? My mentor, Dini Laliotis from the EMDR Institute in DC, she was, you know, training with Francine Shapiro. I think she's like the senior trainer at the EMDR Institute. She's amazing. She's been mentoring me for several years. That was her one piece of advice to me to be an EMDR clinician who's effective, she said, you need to do the work and get where you want your clients to be, okay? And so having done a ton of my own, not just talk therapy, but a ton of my own EMDR work, I have a sense of what it's like to go through it, and I have a sense of what it's like to be on the other side. Am I a perfect person? No. Is everything completely healed and I'm all wrapped up 100%? No. But do I have an understanding personally of what it's like? Yes, I do. So if you have not done that, please make sure that you do that. It's, I think it's part of our kind of responsibility as a clinician to have gone through that process. So that's, that's number one. Okay, so let's talk about the metaphors. So before I share these three metaphors that I, that I use with clients, um, I want to help you understand what I am highlighting in each of these metaphors for clients because there's essentially five things that they need to know, no matter what metaphor I use, okay? And again, if you want this in a handout form, happy to give it to you. You can email me or sign up for the mailing list, no problem. The first thing I want them to know when we do EMDR is, you're not alone this time. First and foremost, that has to be very clear, right? Whatever metaphor you choose. Number two, you are resourced this time, okay? Number three, we're going to keep dual awareness because EMDR isn't just doing BLS back and forth, right? Whether it's eye movements or tactile. B B uh, EMDR, rather, is BLS plus dual awareness, both of those things. And I explain what dual awareness is in each of the metaphors so clients can understand what I mean by that, okay? Number four, you have control this time, okay? So in each of these metaphors, I am very clearly explaining how the client has control. This is huge for our clients who have had complex or relational trauma, developmental trauma. This sense of having someone with them this time, having resources, having control this time is so huge, okay? 
Number five is, I'm sure you've all heard this, but I want to name it because it's so important. Number five is the client who's like, why would I go back and talk about this traumatic, horrible thing just to get upset again? What's the point of doing that? Okay. Sometimes these clients have gone to talk therapy and they've been encouraged to talk about the trauma in, in detail or write it out as a narrative or do it into art or, and all of that is fine. Nothing is wrong with any of that, right? But this is number five is in response to the client saying, why would I go back and relive all of that? when I figured out ways to avoid it, right? It's a great question. Here's what I say. I say this response and it has two parts to it, okay? I say, this is not a car accident that we're just gonna slowly drive by on the highway and just stare and gawk at it and say, oh my gosh, that's so terrible, and then just keep driving on, okay? We are looking at the pain and the trauma with a purpose of reprocessing parts of trauma that are stuck whether it's somatically in your body, whether it's cognitively with a negative cognition, whether it's emotionally, whether it's with images, right? We're not just doing a slow crawl drive by on the highway, like, oh my gosh, that's so terrible. Like, that's not the point of that, okay? So it's important to distinguish that, I think, from talk therapy for people that have never done EMDR before, because how would they understand that? How would they know that, okay? The second part of part five, <laughs> is also really important, which is, you don't even have to tell me. You don't even have to tell me in any kind of detail what happened if you don't want to talk about it, okay? All I need to know is an image, negative cognition, positive cognition, a VOC, body sensation and motion, and a sud. And that can be as vague as you want, right? I, I am totally comfortable with you not telling me in detail the traumatizing thing or things that happen to you because I am not going to re-traumatize you. You have control and I will work with whatever's in the room. So I hope that that makes sense as to why I would want to highlight those five things. Um, and I will talk more about how those first four elements are going to be kind of woven through these, these three metaphors that I'm, I'll share. So um, the first one I'm sure you've heard this one before. Uh, I was trained basic training by Andrew Leeds here in California. Um, this was in my basic training. I don't know if it's in other people's basic training, but this was the metaphor of the train, okay? I'm just gonna talk through this the way I would talk to a client so that you can hear exactly how I say it, okay? And you'll notice the elements, the four elements that I use, okay, throughout. So the train metaphor, okay? I'd say, we're gonna go on a train ride. Even if you haven't been on a train before, you've probably seen a movie or a TV show where they're on a train, okay? And you get the window seat, and I'm right next to you. I'm right next to you the whole time, okay? That's number one, you're not alone, right? Okay, number two is about resources, okay? I say, this train car that we're on is like first class, it is fully stocked. All right, this train has everything that we need to, to ride safely together, okay? So you don't have to worry about not having what you need. And I refer back to these resources that we've installed, right? The calm place, the nurturing figure, protective figure, wise figure, and that we'll continue to be resourcing throughout if we need to, okay? Number three, dual awareness. I say things like this. So on the train, you'll notice there's a very thick window Okay, and you'll just be on the train and you'll notice the scenery going by while we do the BLS. And I'll be sitting next to you quietly. And, you know, you'll just be looking out the window and noticing the scenery and you'll notice some feelings come up and some images and just kind of let your brain associate and go wherever it needs to go. Okay, the train ride is just going to kind of do what it needs to do. And if at any point you notice that you are out of the train and you are actually in the scenery and you're no longer with me in the train, you just stop and let me know, okay? Because we want you to be back in the train with me. Or if you notice that the scenery is coming closer and that window isn't there anymore, that kind of observer barrier, and you're and you're not able to notice that I'm in the train, I'm out of the train, meaning I'm in Cambria's office or I'm not in Cambria's office, just let me know and I'll keep checking that safety with you for you, okay? Control. I say, this train has kind of like a bus, 
an emergency lever, right? That string that goes along the top. I don't know if trains actually have that, but you can pull down on that emergency cord to stop the train at any time, okay? Because you're in a first class car with me, right? We know the conductor. So if you wanna slow down or go faster, you just let me know, okay? You actually have a lot of input about this train in terms of stopping or going faster or slowing down or even just taking a break. If you wanna kinda of pull over and just take a minute, you just let me know, okay? You have so much control on this train, it's amazing. And then I say something like this. You know, sometimes when we are on a train and we're going through a tunnel, it can be kind of dark and scary and uncomfortable, okay? If you wanna stop and you notice that we're in a dark and scary place in a tunnel, you, we can stop, you can pull the lever and let me know, okay? And, and sometimes it's better to just get through the tunnel, okay? Just keep processing, just get through that tunnel knowing that there's gonna be a light at the end and I'm right with you, okay? And I kind of put that, that choice uh, in the metaphor before we start so that they know that if they're processing and they're coming up on some really hard, intense stuff, they always get to choose, right? I can keep going or I can stop. I get to decide this time. So that's the train metaphor. Again, I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard that one. Um, the second metaphor is about time travel, right? EMDR is like time travel. It really is. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty incredible how our brain can go to all these different memories of the past and the present um, and even future with future template, right? So the movie that I like to um, refer to is A Christmas Carol. And for those of you who have seen this movie, there is a ghost of Christmas past, a ghost of Christmas present, and a ghost of Christmas future. Again, this metaphor may not be appropriate for certain clients, but I wanted to give you some choices because you'll kind of have a sense of who can handle what metaphor. So um, thinking about having, you know, a guide, a ghost movie, right? A guide come to be with you to look at the past, right? So in this scenario, I'm kind of like the ghost of Christmas past. So um, I am the guide who's coming to be with you to look at your past with you, okay? And then thinking about resourcing, I think in the movie, it's been a while since I watched it, I think in the movie, the, the main character had to like go in his pajamas with the ghost and the ghost was kind of bossy and controlling. But in this situation, you get to pack a bag full of your resources that we've installed and you kind of get to have, you get what you need to go back and look at the past with me as your guide, okay? You're not gonna go alone. Dual awareness. So you are gonna be in your present self going back in time with me, your guide, with all the things that you need packed up, okay? And you get to be an observer. And as the observer, things might, come up for you. You might notice things differently. Um, you might see things through more of like adult eyes. And you might also notice your past self feeling some really big feelings and having some hard times. And you might feel those feelings again too. But we'll check in and make sure you have that dual awareness that you have a sense of your present self and your past self. And you might notice that your past self might start to feel different for you, okay? That's kind of the integration processing piece. Control. So, like I said, I think that the ghost of Christmas past in the movie was kind of bossy and directive. But in this situation, you can decide if you want to stop and go back to the present. Again, stop and go back and to the present and not go back to the past, or just take a break and go back, right? You get to decide how you want to handle that, because I'm going to trust your choice about what you need around that, okay? So that's the second metaphor. I hope that makes sense. Again, not for every client, but maybe some clients will like that, okay? And I think most people have seen that movie. Number three. Number three is my favorite metaphor, and it's the one that I use pretty much most of the time. So I will preface this by saying that um, I do live in California. I have been in a couple of earthquakes. Um, none of the, you know... Situations I've been in with California earthquakes have been traumatic or really scary for me. So obviously if someone has had that situation, maybe you don't use this metaphor. But the metaphor is a rescue mission, okay? And the visual I talk about is we're going to go on a rescue mission. We're going to go into that building that has fallen down in the earthquake, okay? And we're going to go get 
parts of you that are still stuck in there, right? This gets to that point I mentioned, point five, about why are we doing this, right? This metaphor is so great for clients that are like, I don't think I need to do EMDR because I can just kind of handle the triggers and kind of just live with it. And I, I say, yeah, that's your choice. That's totally your choice to do that. However, it's pretty clear what parts of you are stuck because they're screaming out at you from this building to come and rescue them, okay? Whether it's through nightmares or body aches and pains or IBS or migraines, right? Or strong feelings. I think that makes sense to clients when I say the past is actually here now. So I don't know that's going to be, um, uh, I think that'll be clarifying for clients who are kind of trying to convince themselves that maybe they shouldn't do EMDR because it's going to bring up past stuff, right? It helps them understand your past stuff is actually here and it's screaming at you, okay? So again, so for this third metaphor of the rescue mission, we'll say it is not safe to go into this building to reclaim these parts of yourself, right? Unless you have a team we're going to bring these resources with us. We're going to bring your calm place, your nurturing figure, protective figure, wise figure, whatever resources you've installed, whether it's a, an external figure or it's an internal quality you've installed. We're going to bring all those resources with us into this building that's all rubble and falling apart and kind of dangerous, right? We're going to go in and I'm going to be with you. And I this is where I kind of like to make clients have some humor about this. I say to them things like, you know, I'm kind of like the rock in those rescue missions, right? I am trained for this. I am experienced. I am confident. I am like ready to go, right? I am I am the rock in basically all of the movies where he goes into some building that's fallen down to save somebody. And clients kind of like that. They kind of get feel safe like, oh, Cambrai knows what she's doing even though it's it's the client's first rescue mission, right? So that that fear makes sense. So dual awareness the metaphor of we're going to go get parts of you that are left behind in the trauma, right, in the building, helps us keep dual awareness because we have our rescuer, our, our kind of present day part that's going on in the rescue mission, and then we have these parts that are stuck, right? If at any point those parts kind of feel like we're not clear on, on what's what, we'll kind of stop and make sure we're grounded and having that dual awareness again, okay? Let's talk about control with this metaphor. So. And I create this image of, we're going to tie a rope to a tree right outside the building, okay? So if we go into this building and it gets like really dark or you're feeling trapped in there and stuck and you can't figure out how to get out, we're going to have this rope. We can kind of like find our way back to now, okay? So that's kind of the control with the dual awareness, all right? And you get to decide on the rescue mission just like, you know, firefighters or any other kind of rescue helpers get to decide if they need to leave that building and take a break, get some air, get some water, have a snack, whatever it is, just regroup and then go back in or maybe regroup and just kind of stop for the day. They have control over all of that. Okay. Because doing a rescue mission safely is more important than doing a rescue mission quickly. Right. That's a great way to talk about EMDR processing there. <clears throat> So I hope that that feels helpful <clears throat> in terms of the three uh, metaphors you might want to consider using with your clients to help them understand what EMDR is like. I often share um, other clients' experiences with my current or potential clients considering EMDR to give them some confidence about what I've seen in my office. And I also say to them, the reason I do EMDR all day, every day, is because I have done EMDR as a client and I'm a huge nerd. I have a huge research background. Like the, the research on this is strong and my personal experience is really strong and my clients are having good experiences and just giving them that confidence, um, I think helps them feel like it's going to be okay. Obviously with a caveat that it's not going to work for everybody. We can't guarantee that. But I think that there is a balance between not guaranteeing something and inspiring confidence in them. Again, I came into this video today wanting to come from a place of connection with you and love and hope and bravery, okay? And I think that a lot of people are going to need a lot of EMDR after all of the trauma that's been happening in the world um, with, you know, the pandemic, 
with the job losses, with the domestic violence, uh, with the racism, with the social injustice, the police brutality, I think a lot of clients are going to need EMDR now. It is possible to do virtually. It's effective. People are benefiting. And um, I am here to help teach you. If you feel uncomfortable about doing that, please reach out to me. I have other videos I can share with you. I can consult with you about that. Happy to, to help. Um, but I think that if we can inspire, again, love, hope, and bravery for our clients to process their trauma and increase their capacity, I think that's one of the most beautiful things that we can do um, in response to all of the really hard things that are happening in the world right now. So I hope this feels helpful to you, and I will look forward to connecting with you next time. And in the meanwhile, I hope that you um, stay healthy and safe and be well. Take care.